love answering questions. All right, we're at noon. You ready? Cool. Let's do it. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Bree Kimberling. I am a nurse at North Kansas City Hospital in Community Health and Wellness. Um, thank you for joining us today. We have a great speaker, Laura Ashbaugh. She is a master's degree in clinical psychology and is a licensed professional counselor in Missouri and a nationally certified counselor. She has worked in the field of community mental health for over 15 years. In that time, she has worked in a crisis st stabilization unit, residential facilities, outpatient case management, and outpatient counseling. She currently provides clinical and administrative trainings as well as supervision and mentoring in her role as senior project coordinator at University Health Behavioral Health. That's a mouthful. She no, is so I know it's terrible. <laughs> she is passionate about finding and utilizing a patient's strengths to help them build the life that they want. We love that. And outside of mental health, she teaches lifespan development, psychology, abnormal psych, at various community colleges and universities. And you added in a couple of new classes you're doing, which was what, death and dying? So I'm doing, a, I teach intro psych and uh, death and dying out at Longview Community College. In her spare time, she enjoys spending time with her family, seeing movies and traveling the world. So Laura, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we have the chat and the Q&A open. We love questions. Please be interactive. And we have a question. I love it. Um, so well, hey, right. as an adult, how do we get a diagnosis of ADHD? Mentioned for primary care is referral to a specialist, benefits of being diagnosed, checking the boxes, assuming someone has that's a great question. So you who can give you a diagnosis? Um there really isn't an adult ADHD specialist. So a psychiatrist can give you a diagnosis, a therapist can give you a diagnosis. Um, the benefit of a diagnosis. One, it might provide you with the sense of like, yes, I have this kind of like a check the box. I, this is who I am and help you clarify to yourself a smidgen. It also can, if you're seeking medical type of um, treatments, you want medications, things of that nature, certain providers are going to want that diagnosis before they provide and prescribe medication. So that can also be a benefit. If you are not wanting medication and are just um, thinking this is a, a long and who you might be, I certainly would not. You don't have to have a diagnosis. Um, you can do a little bit of self-diagnosis and then do some reading materials um, related to those areas. So it's not necessarily I have to. It just depends what you're looking for involving treatment. Awesome question. Uh, so thank you right off the bat. I'm really happy to answer your questions and I'll do the best I can to answer them as we go. Um, as Brie mentioned, I'm Laura Ashbaugh. And I'm here to talk about women and ADHD, um, a particular topic that is near and dear to my heart. And um, like I said, ask questions at any point in time. This particular presentation, for those of you who may have heard us kind of chit-chatting before we got started, this really came from my own personal life experience and what I have learned about myself as a woman who is a professional and has ADHD that really came to light through the events of COVID um, and has really been and trying to help myself understand me, I then kind of fell into this and like more people need to know about this. And that kind of where is this presentation came from. So as we go, I will give a few more personal examples than I usually do in my presentations to illustrate some experiences and describe what we're going to be talking about. Um, so what I hope you guys walk away from today is I hope you walk away with this sense of like what it means to have ADHD, both as a male and as a woman. Um, some of the social differences in that diagnosis, you know, why do we talk about it in terms of women and not just ADHD? And then I also hope you walk away with a few um, behavioral techniques or ideas of where to get more resources or how to cope with some symptoms. Those are a few things I hope you walk away with. So a lot of information to cover in an hour, and we're going to do our best to get through it. Um, and um, I will give a word of caution. Um, so I do want you to be careful of self-diagnosis. It is something that we are we very easily do, not just for ADHD, but for a lot of mental health symptoms. We start to, you know, I originally I had clients coming to me because they watch TikTok videos. And they're like, Laura, I watched this on TikTok and I think it's me. Let's talk about it. And while a little part of like the professional in me kind of rolls my eyes, at the same time, those TikToks or you know, reels or other social media is a way for people to share their story 
And if you see something that sounds like you and it opens the door for research and information, I'm, I'm all for that. Um, so, but do be careful as I talk about things, try not to like totally self-diagnose yourself. Just, oh, that's me. I wonder if, and ask the question and learn more. That's really the idea is to continue to learn more. We want to also be careful of the diagnosis or saying boy, girl, or boy ADHD or girl ADHD. It really isn't one versus the other. It's more women tend to have this and men tend to have that. The presentation is slightly different but it's still ADHD as a whole. And I do tend to use the binary, like male, female, boy, girl, however. And I do that because research is still out on what it means to be non-binary and what that looks like in terms of diagnosis and symptom presentation. Um, so I tend to use the binary words, but I do not want to deny or um, not acknowledge the existence of those who do not experience gender in a binary way. We just need more information about what it looks like for their symptoms. So let's start with always good to begin at the beginning, which is what is ADHD? So we it's one of those things I think people like think, oh, I think it's this, but what really does it look like? So ADHD stands for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. If you're like me and you were alive in the 80s, you probably heard about ADD, which is no longer used in our language. We don't use the diagnosis ADD anymore or attention deficit disorder. And they changed the language and put everything underneath ADHD. So attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. The symptoms are going to fall into two specific categories. One is going to be more inattentive, forgetful, distractible. And the other is going to be more like impulsive, um, hyperactive kind of behaviors. You can have one or the other. You also can have a little bit of both. Many people have symptoms that fall into both categories. Um, but that is kind of our overarching idea of what ADHD is. One of the challenges, and I think this is where I really think it's important to talk about the misnomer. We use the language attention deficit and people think that means we can't pay attention. And that's really not what's happening. Um, unfortunately, language is tricky and we could have called this something very differently many years ago. But really what it is, it's not that people can't pay attention. It's that they can't regulate their attention. For those who do not have ADHD, there's lots of, well, we all, everyone is getting tons and tons of sensory experience every second of every day. So I'm sitting here in my office. I have books everywhere. I have my kids' art. I have my computers and screens and all types of things around me. I'm getting a lot of visual information. I'm getting a lot of sensory, like my computer's making a buzzing sound. I can hear other sounds like my neighbor's doing things outside. And we get this information and most people are able to tune out the things that don't matter. They just kind of ignore their brains like, this isn't important information. I don't need to hear this or I don't need to see this. Those who have ADHD struggle to regulate that attention. They get distracted by all of this um, sensory noise for that matter. So one example I'll give, so here in my office, I have a window to the front of my house and the neighbor kids across the street have a tendency to play basketball for hours on end. And so I will sit here and I can hear the constant thump of their um, basketball on the ground for hours. And for most people, you probably wouldn't even notice it and it wouldn't, like, oh, they wouldn't even pay attention. On some days, that's all I can sit here and hear is the basketball making noise. And that's not about the lack of attention, it's about the lack of regulation. I don't need to know that they're playing basketball, but my brain can't turn it off. So what that is one reason why we end up with what seems to be very, um, the good word I'm looking for here, very confusing symptoms. Uh, so we'll call it hyper-focus. So a person who has ADHD struggles to regulate their attention, which means sometimes they either can't focus on anything or they focus too much. And that's hyper-focus. This is an intense fixation on an interest or an activity for an extended period of time, hours on end. They are involved in this project or hours on end, they're doing this. And they go into these modes of hyper-focus. And that can be very confusing for parents and for people experiencing it. You're like, when I want to pay attention, sometimes I can't. And my brain is all over. But then other times I can't stop paying attention 
and I get nothing else done. And it looks like a lack of willpower, a lack of direction. It looks like this negative experience when really it is simply their brain is like, this is what I'm focused on and I'm going to stick to it. It can be super helpful when you're trying to get something done and you can hyper focus. That's awesome. People with ADHD often don't have the ability to turn that off and on. So it depends on the context, whether it's problematic or not. So when we start talking about ADHD, we're talking about this lack of regulation of attention. And that plays out in a variety of different behaviors and actions. So this is one of the pictures I really like is the what people think ADHD is and what it actually is. It's the idea of this iceberg. Um, so we have people think ADHD is trouble focusing and fidgeting. But in reality, underneath the surface is all of these other pieces. It is depression, executive dysfunction, impulse control, sleeping problems, trouble regulating emotions, forgetting to eat, sleep, and go to the bathroom. And absolutely, this is a thing that happens for people. They forget to eat, sleep, and go to the bathroom because they are hyper-focused on the activity in front of them. And difficulty following and maintaining conversations. If you're having a, a hard time focusing and regulating your attention, because all you can hear is the computer making noise, you don't hear what the person in front of you is saying. So at some point, you're just like, and you agree to things because you don't want to be that person who asks what for the third or fourth time. You really do care, but you just can't get your brain to focus on it. So you start seeing all of these other behaviors that play into relationships, work, and how a person views themselves. Because if we don't think of difficulty following and maintaining conversations as a symptom, it looks like you don't care. You're selfish, you're self-centered, um, kind of spacey, you know, some of those negative things that we say about people. And that starts to create a sense of who you are. And it becomes about, this is who I am and not a symptom of the illness that I struggle with. And those are two very different ways of viewing ourselves. Um, so ADHD really is many of these pieces. And as we get into what it looks like for women, we can start to see this play out even further. Um, so in terms of how many people have ADHD, this is always a question, what is the prevalence? Um, how, what's the percentage of the population? ADHD is one of the most commonly diagnosed disorders in childhood. So on average, you know, about 9.4%, so about 10% of children between the ages of two and 17 have ever been diagnosed with this. So it's a pretty large percentage. And you will notice that, uh, oh, great question. I'll answer that question in just a second. Um, what you notice here is we also, not only we have about 10% of the population diagnosed with ADHD, when we look at gender, we see a significant difference in gender. Boys are much more likely to receive an ADHD diagnosis than girls. So you see a 12.9 versus 5.6. And this is for a long time, it was thought that was because girls just didn't have ADHD. I, when I was putting this presentation together and I was talking to people about it, I had coworkers say, why? I thought ADHD was just a boy thing. Girls can have it too. Like it was almost this like unrealized idea. Of like, no, women can also have this. And um, we just diagnose it more in men and boys. So I see a question here. When you talk about the sounds and difficulty of focusing, this sounds similar to my case of misphonia being treated by audiologists or misphonia and ADHD women related. You know, that is an excellent question. If you give me about five seconds, I will look that up. It probably, my first gut set is to say yes, um, but we're gonna do, um, uh, and yes, it is very commonly comorbidly found together. Um, misphonia and ADHD are often found together. And there's a hypersensitivity to sounds and sights that you will see in people with ADHD because they cannot filter. Um, so yes, they are commonly found together. Um, it would be important to die, separate them out, but they can be very comorbid. Um, that is a great question. Now, uh, that one, Bobby, I cannot answer. I will look it up, give you a second. Um, are there long-term medical issues of taking ADHD meds for years? I'm not a psychiatrist and I don't prescribe meds. And so I don't have a ton of information about medications. Um, I mean, in general, there is 
usually long-term side effects for anything that we take on the long-term, but I could not speak to what that looks like for ADHD, but I will try to find that information for you. Questions, love them, keep them coming. Uh, so when we start seeing this difference between the diagnosis rate between men and women, boys and girls, the question then becomes why? Why do we see this difference? And what then ultimately can we do about it? Use the right computer here, there we go. So there's a couple of reasons and we're gonna get into some of these too as well. So why are girls and women underdiagnosed? First and foremost, it is not just about ADHD, but it's about the samples that we utilize. So research on ADHD uses a male sample. And this is pretty typical across the board in science. Um, and it's something that we as a society and a medical community are really trying to come to terms with. I see Brie kind of nodding her head. A lot of what we've done research on is on men. And the assumption is then made, well, men are kind of the like average standard person and what applies to them applies to everybody. And what we're learning is that's not necessarily true. Um, and so we, and that's also true, not only for gender, but also for race um, and variety of different pieces. We have to look at, is it the same for everybody? So we start with the ADHD uses a male sample, and this is across the board a problem. You'll see it, you know, heart attacks. There's a lot of research about how women have very different heart attack symptoms and are having higher rates of heart attacks because they don't realize what they're experiencing is a heart attack. They think it's something different. Some indigestion, for example, is a common sign in women where you don't typically find that in men. Um, so heart attacks, strokes, um, a variety of medical areas we're finding women have slightly different symptoms or very different presentations that we need to update our knowledge. One thing I appreciate about science is that science is a never ending endeavor to learn. And so we're learning, we need to do better about looking at the differences between different types of people. Um, and this is not just a medical community problem. We see this in other areas as well. One of my favorite really random factoids is that we didn't start using female shaped test dummies to test car accidents until 2003. So like 20 years ago, we've had cars for a lot longer than 20 years, right? Correct. Women's bodies are differently shaped. Our hip structure is different. Our chest structure is different. We have a different center of gravity. And that if you don't test for and account for can change how the safety systems function. And we didn't have that until 20 years ago. Uh, so you see this in lots of different areas that we just need more information and we need to learn more and be better. And that's part of being and growing as a, as a scientist and as a society. Um, I do. So yes, yeah, so Julie, I will get to that toward the end. So don't like that, make that question go away. Keep that one up there. So I'll be sure to come back to that one. Okay. Um, so the other reasons girls and women are underdiagnosed is they have different presentations of symptoms. And this speaks to, again, that research sample. So women, and we'll talk about this more in just a minute as well, women tend to have their symptoms look a little different. They present a little different. And so they get misdiagnosed as anxiety. They misdiagnosis depression. It comes up in a variety of different places. And we also have very different societal expectations of women. And that I've been watching a lot of, um, you know, I'm not ashamed to admit that I do on occasion watch TikTok. There are some fun things out there. And I'm very on this kick about the emotional load and talking about how it's not just what you do and having tasks be equal is about the emotional load of a household and how that also has to be equal in partnerships and relationships. And so women are expected to do different things to manage a household. And that particularly in adulthood can become very challenging if you're already struggling with ADHD and attention and focus struggles. It's a, just enough to get yourself dressed. It's enough to then have to get your kids dressed and your husband and the dog taken care of. And all of a sudden, this list of expectations becomes very overwhelming and very unmanageable. And that's why we're starting to see more women being diagnosed in their um, adulthood rather than in their teen years. Uh, we mask symptoms. 
So women tend to also be a little bit more socially aware. This is part of how we're socialized and, and a little bit of some genetic differences there as well. And so we tend to, we know what's supposed to be done of us and we know what's expected of us. And so we put on this mask that shows the world what we want them to see. But underneath, we're hiding those secrets. Um, I see this a lot. I have a lot of clients went through COVID when I was seeing uh, early 20s women. Um, they would come to me, you know, they have, a, they have a new job or they're fresh out of college and they're like, oh, I can't keep my house clean. I can't have friends over because I don't want them to see what my house looks like. And they put on this face of the put together, well-organized, like business professional. And behind the scenes, they hid their shame of their doom piles and their laundry piles and the like closet that falls on you when you're full of stuff, because that was what they knew they were supposed to do. And that is that idea of masking where we're putting on a front for the world to see. And women are much better at this um, than men. And then, like I said, misdiagnosis is they often are misdiagnosed as having an anxiety disorder or a depression disorder rather than an attention disorder. It's a really, really common misdiagnosis. Um, so I see another question coming over here. Um, okay, so I cannot answer the question about max daily dosage because I'm not a psychiatrist. That one I cannot answer. Um, however, other alternative things ADHD people can do or instead of taking meds, absolutely. So there is, um, so my background is mental health. So as a therapist, I work on and help with the cognitive behavioral aspect of treatment of ADHD. And there are absolutely lots of different ways that we can approach ADHD symptoms from cognitive behavioral therapy in terms of helping adjust behaviors, adjust their thought patterns, and shape their world in such a way that helps them function within it and thrive within it. And so we'll get to those, leave that question up there as well, because we'll talk about some of those um, treatment options a little bit later. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why women and girls are underdiagnosed the research, the presentations, the expectations, the masking, and then of course, misdiagnosis. So let's take a look at what some of these differences are. What do we see a little bit different in women versus men? Uh, so first of all, men slash boys tend to be diagnosed more with hyperactive and impulsive symptoms. This is your classic, what people think of when they think of ADHD. This is the person who can't sit still, the fidgets, the like the tapping, the disruption in class. It's the other piece, this hyperactivity and impulsivity creates more social problems in social settings because the boy in class who is running around the room causing issues is much more problematic to the group and the teacher as a whole than the girl who's sitting in her chair who cannot read the page because she's read it 10 times. One is much more obvious and much more, I mean, it's kind of the squeaky wheel gets the oil kind of a situation, in, particularly in a school setting. Uh, so men and boys tend to have much more of that hyperactive focus, whereas women tend to have more inattentive symptoms. So it's not, now men can have inattentive and women can be more hyperactive. But again, we'll start to see how that looks a little different as well. Uh, so women tend to have more difficulty focusing, more difficulty paying attention to details, difficulty staying organized, listening and remembering things. Uh, I'll give an example. This is actually, uh, my sister did this the other day, paying attention to details. Uh, so my both my sister and I and most of my family have to eat gluten-free. We have celiac disease. Um, so for Thanksgiving, we're making all of our food. We made stuffing and corn casserole and sweet potatoes and green bean casserole and all of this really awesome, beautiful, delicious gluten-free food. We get to end, we get to the end, we're cleaning the kitchen. And my husband goes, did you use this, this cooking spray? And I was like, well, yeah, Courtney brought the cooking spray. She'd grab cooking spray off the shelf. And if you know anything about cooking spray, there's a new version out there that is oil and flour. My celiac sister brought to our cooking of celiac gluten-free food extravaganza cooking oil with flour in it that we used on every single dish. So literally the entire day, we had six trays of food that neither one of us could eat because of the very small and sort of important detail of with flour on the cooking spray. And those are the type of things that like 
we laugh about it. It's now the Thanksgiving we poisoned ourselves. That's what we're going to call it from years on, but it's that attention to detail. It's those things that when you hear that, you hear that story, you think that story, you're like, oh, well, that was just absent-minded or, oh, that was kind of stupid or, oh, that wasn't real smart. And that's the language that we get with girls. We get this, well, you need to just work harder. You needed to care more. Um, I think about when I was in first grade, I remember very distinctly, I got in trouble because I didn't finish my homework. So I didn't finish my papers. And I was grounded from my bike for a week, which was a really big deal in first grade me. And I remember my mother and I having this conversation because she was like, Laura, why is this not done? Because it wasn't done in a way that made sense. It wasn't like I did two questions and then stopped and just didn't finish the ones on the end. It wasn't like I skipped the easy, the hard questions and only did the easy ones. It was as if I just didn't see a question on the page and just didn't answer it. And I remember her like, I remember looking at being like, I don't know why I didn't do it. I thought I finished it. And I probably did think I finished it, but I just managed to just not read questions and just left them blank. It's those type of things that women tend to do that gets categorized as something different. My whole life, I've told people, I'm an absent-minded professor. If I don't have my head screwed on, I'm going to forget it. And people laugh and it's just kind of like, oh, that's just Laura. Oh, we just have to keep track of her. And starting to think about it, no, that's actually part of my illness. It's not just I'm absent-minded and don't care. It's part of that ADHD. And this is the, the insidiousness and the challenge of diagnosing women with ADHD and how they get very miscategorized and very stigmatized. We don't see it as a diagnosis. So they tend to have more of those inattentive symptoms and a little bit less of the hyper-focus or the hyperactive, excuse me. Um, now, when they do have hyperactivity, it tends to look different. So we see this, these two pictures here. Okay, so we have our girl studiously taking you know tests and looking down, and then we have our boy kind of like feet all over everywhere. And most people would look at this and say, the boy has ADHD and the girl does not because he is fidgeting and moving around and she's looking at her paper carefully. What we don't see is internally in her brain. And this is what happens for girls. The hyperactivity, if they have it, tends to be internal. So instead of running around a classroom, their brain inside is going to and is running, 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 running. So this girl sitting here has tried to read this paper 10 times and cannot focus on the words. And her brain is like, well, if I do this, if I do that, if I do this, and then just going, 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 going. But outwardly, you see this put together calm individual, but internally the brain is just running and that leads to that difficulty in focus, but comes out in those ways that look like you just don't care. The other piece you see with hyperactivity in girls is verbal versus physical. So in general, and again, I'm talking generalities, but in general, girls have, they mature at their verbal rate matures faster than boys. And so girls will often talk sooner, will have more language, more, more vocabulary when they're younger. They tend to be more verbal and less physical, whereas a boy matures in his physicality faster than girls. So what oftentimes happens is girls' hyperactivity is verbal. They talk fast. You know, so I'm talking fast right now. I'm not just because I'm trying to cram information in. It's really hard for me to talk slow. It is a verbal hyperactivity. So instead of running around a classroom, this is a girl that just won't stop talking. And you have to put her with all the other kids to get her to stop talking because she'll chit chat with the wall. That is an ADHD. And we look at, well, you're just super social or you're a social butterfly. It has some nice names, but then it also has some like, you know, you need to be quiet. You need to listen better. You're a bad listener. You're selfish. You're self-centered. All of those languages and uh, words that we use. So sometimes for women and girls in particular, we don't start to see this become a problem until they hit their teen years. So many girls are able to manage and cobble together coping skills that help them get through elementary school. So they have ways of masking. They have ways of coping. 
that allow them to kind of fly underneath the radar because they're not causing problems in school. They're, you know, they get semi-decent grades. No one's seeing the internal struggle. They might have to be a little, you know, chit-chatty or told to be quiet, but they learn, oh, I'm supposed to be quiet in school. And they put on this face of the like nice, neat, organized person that gets a middle school when middle school becomes very much about friendships and relationships. And they start to struggle in those relationships because they are verbally hyperactive. They talk too fast for their friends or they seem like they don't listen enough to their friends because they're always talking about themselves or interrupting. And it starts to create these social difficulties, which then makes them feel like there's something wrong with them. And again, you notice each one of these symptoms, we start to categorize as something else. And now I've got a 13 year old girl who's kind of withdrawn, who is you know, disconnecting from her friends, who isn't doing well in school. And it looks like depression and it looks like anxiety when really it is their coping skills of ADHD that have just no longer function anymore. So these differences in presentation, the internal hyperactivity and the verbal hyperactivity are some of those differences that you see in addition to having more of the inattentive type. So I see a question, could racing thoughts be, yes, absolutely racing thoughts could be considered internal hyperactivity. That is one of the symptoms that you see with women in ADHD is that their brain just runs like a little, I have a hamster. So it just runs like a hamster in the wheel and just goes, 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 goes. That can potentially be a symptom of that. Absolutely. So in girls, we see these predominant symptoms of inattentive, inattentive, inattentive behavior. They fail to give close attention and make careless mistakes. I gave you those examples. They appear not to be listening. So they, you know, uh, this is actually something my husband, who is also has ADHD, him and I've had many a fight through the years because he looks like he's doing something else. He looks like he's on his phone. He looks like he's doing something, not, not paying attention. He's like, I am paying attention. But if I look at you, my brain won't let me listen. And so I have to have something else to like let the, the hamster run so I can listen over here. Oh my God, I have to learn that about each other. Um, but that can be a struggle in social relationships. They appear not to be listening. And I, for myself, one thing I find that I actually found super helpful because of COVID, um, because of COVID, I started doing telehealth therapy. So therapy is one of those things where you really need to be attentive and listen and make a person feel like they're listening. Being listened to is kind of an important skill set in therapy. And um, I found in uh, telehealth, it really narrowed my focus because I couldn't see anything but my face in the screen. And so I knew that they couldn't see my feet tapping. They couldn't see, I used to have a bunch of like fidget toys and I would like sit and play with Legos. I would like do all kinds of things that nobody can see underneath my camera. So all they could see was this face listening very intently and the rest of my body was fidgeting in a way that wasn't distracting. And that it helped me a lot, I think, be a better therapist. And also I started to notice more of the like, oh my gosh, I spend half my time when you're in front of me worried about fidgeting. This it makes sense. So they appear not to be listening. They have difficulty with organization. They lose things easily. Uh, so I actually should put a slide about, about this. There is one of the struggles in ADHD is what's called object permanence, okay? So if you go back to, I teach lifespan, if you're familiar with children at all, object permanence is an important developmental milestone where small children learn that when you don't see a thing, it still exists. That's object permanence. Now, those who have ADHD know that just because they can't see it, they know it still exists. But what happens is when they can't see it, their brain forgets about it. And they don't factor it into their thought process of how to accomplish a task. So for example, um, one of the things you think like our kitchens. So in a kitchen, everything's behind a cabinet or behind a drawer. So what ends up happening whenever I go to cook, I literally use the same pan and the same spatula to make anything because those are the two things that are sitting on the counter. And my husband will walk in. He's like, Laura, you know, there's a another spoon that might work, but oh, I forgot. 
up so much simpler. I forgot that existed. That is object permanence. And so they struggle organization, they lose things as they forget that it, where it was or what it is and it disappears from existence. Um, so one, uh, and one tip for that is to not put things away or to put things away. You can kind of sort of see over in the corner. I started to use um, clear desk, organize, desk organizers. So instead of having drawers that people, that things go into that then become a black hole of nothing, everything is now in an organized box, but the box itself is clear. So I can see everything inside of it if I go over and glance at it. So that is one way that can help people to shift their thinking and their way of functioning. You know, we go back to our kitchen. Don't just put things in drawers. You put things in, you know, organize circles or cabinets on the, on the counter. So you have, or you use those fancy cabinets that are now open. So that way you can see what you have. That makes a huge difference in having, knowing where things are and using what, how your brain functions to help you live. Um, so they're easily distracted, forgetful in daily activities. Um, just the other day, I was more than one time, I'll lose my phone and I'll have to wander back around the house to figure out where I set it down because I got distracted doing something. They daydream a lot and they often have poor time management and poor, poor planning. And we'll talk about more about that in just a second. Um, so we see these symptoms in both men and women, but primarily in women. So if you look at this list and you see this list, minus the idea of ADHD, you can see how someone is going to start to think really poorly of themselves. I'm just lazy. I just, I'm just disorganized. I, I, and people, you don't care. You're this, all of these negative stigmatized language from these behaviors that are very easily described by ADHD. So kind of be thinking about that. Um, so our gender norms, we talked a little bit about this, the masking, the societal expectations, symptoms seen as a character flaw in people and people pleasing. Um, there is a very much a drive to make people happy. Women struggle with that pretty often and women who have ADHD struggle with that even further. Um, so we have these expectations in our society that a woman is the manager of the household that she is the keeper of the schedule, that she is the maker of the calendar and the menu. She's the maker of the grocery list. She's all of these things that involve organizing, keeping track of things, time management, all of these things that she may not be good at. And she feels like a horrible mother and a horrible wife. And it starts to feed on that sense of self-esteem. And you can see why they show up in my office thinking they have depression and wanting to deal with their self-worth. And really, it's ADHD. And so let's talk about a couple of these examples of symptoms specific to not just women, but ADHD in general that can be seen from different lights. One of my favorites that I talk a lot about is time blindness. All right, so time blindness is a symptom where you struggle to sense the passage of time. Okay? So for those who have the ability to do this, this seems like an obvious sort of like, I didn't realize everyone had that sense of ability. So I'll give an example. My mother-in-law um, works for Children's Mercy. She is a neonatal uh, NICU nurse and has been for uh, probably like 40 years now. And one of the things when her and I were having this conversation about this presentation and she goes, Laura, I can tell you it's been 30 seconds. It's been one minute. It's been five minutes. And I can tell you that without having to look at a watch. She just has this innate sense of how long it has been since time has passed, which has helped make her really good in her job as a nurse who has to have attention to detail. And in this conversation with her, I was like, yeah, I have absolutely no idea. I, I couldn't tell you, has it been 10 minutes? Has it been five hours? I have no clue how long it has been in any conversation. That's why I have clocks everywhere. And so what happens when you struggle to have the sense of passage of time, you end up doing a couple of things. You over or underestimate how much time has passed. I will give an example this week. I am notorious for being late. I work very, very hard not to be late, but I just struggle with it for this exact reason. So this week, I have a habit in the morning. It's not just you hit a snooze button. It's that, okay, I get up at this time and I need to, you know, take a shower, brush my teeth, 
get dressed. And each one of these tasks takes a certain amount of time. And when you have time blindness, you underestimate how long those tasks might take. So like, oh, I can get dressed. I can do that in 30 seconds. Um, no, not really. I can't do it in 30 seconds. And then what becomes, I think I have five minutes. I'm going to get it done in five minutes actually turns into 10. And now all of a sudden you're behind schedule and you add this up throughout the day, throughout a morning routine and all time is lost. So one of the things that I have started to do for myself, pardon me, is they, I will set timers. So not just alarms. I need to know that it's 730. I need to know that five minutes has passed. And so I have a series of timers on my phone. So when I get up in the morning, I'm like, all right, five minute timer. I need to be done with this activity in five minutes. And that gives me, I'm never done in five minutes with the activity, but it at least gives me an idea of where I'm at in the time frame and in the schedule and in the routine to get out the door. And this week I got in the shower. I gave myself five minutes to take a quick shower. And apparently I forgot to hit start on the timer. So I, in the shower, I was like, it's been nice. And then I get out of the shower and I realize the timer didn't go off. What I thought had been five minutes had actually been like probably 20. And I was like way late to where I needed to be because I had no semblance idea of how much time had passed. And so what ends up happening is I end up being late, which then makes me look bad and makes me feel bad and creates the ripple effect of these experiences. And it all stems from this struggle with inability to sense the passage of time. Has it been too long? Has it been too little? And how do I order my tasks? You know, not knowing how long a task is gonna take and not knowing which of two is going to take longer. This will also happen. You know, like, oh, I've got these two tasks to complete today. I think task one is gonna take three hours. I think task two is gonna take 10 minutes. I'm going to start with task two. Oh, wrong. Task two actually takes two hours. 10 minutes was a significant underestimation. And now your whole day is screwed up. And it leads to a lot of negative self-talk and a lot of negative beliefs, and negative opinions put on you. So this next slide I'm going to show, I'll be honest, like totally like boils me like with anger. Um, a friend of mine, mm -hmm, no. person I used to work with who I'm still friends with on social media. Let's put him as that. Um, wouldn't call him a friend so much. Person I used to work with posted this on their social media. And to me, this is a beautiful example of the struggles in society with understanding people and their illnesses and their disabilities. So we're going to look at this one. Uh, punctuality. Consistently being on time is the product of proper planning, personal discipline, and respect for other people's time. Making a habit of being late demonstrates none of these things and is often a sign of patchy priorities and selfishness. Habitual lateness says my time is more valuable than yours. Learn to be reliable and a person of integrity by adopting the discipline necessary to be on time. Oh, I love, re like, I love your face. You just, you're like, oh, oh. And the comments that she got on this post were like, yes, it's right. Oh my gosh, that's so true. Here's the thing. I'm not saying you should let people be on time, be let people late all the time and just randomly accept that. What I'm saying is this is a beautiful example of how what can is an illness and a disability is seen as a character flaw. This is no different than telling your friend in a wheelchair, if you tried it enough, hard enough, you could go up the stairs. I don't need to put a ramp into my home. If you cared about me, you'd find a way to get up my steps in your wheelchair. If our friendship was that important, you'd do that for me. That's essentially what we're saying when we say these type of things, because we're denying the reality and the, the struggle and the challenge of those who have disabilities different than our own. And just like many other mental illnesses, they are hidden and invisible. And this speaks to the struggle that women have, is that women take this on personally. I mean, I saw this and I, I still like, I still feel this to my core. I'm a horrible person because I can't be on time. Um, even though I know all the facts about it. 
So this just speaks to that struggle and why you see dis depression, anxiety, and higher rates of suicide and higher rates of substance use in those who have ADHD. Um, so one other symptom, and then we'll shift into the positives as I'm getting toward the end of time. Um, so this is called rejection sensitive dysphoria. This exists in both men and women, but it does happen more in women. Um, this is a particular symptom of ADHD where they have extreme emotional sensitivity and pain triggered by the perception that a person has been rejected or criticized. And so this is not a, oh, you said something mean, now I feel bad about me. This is, I'll give an example. Um, this happened a few weeks ago. My husband and my family and I were out at Oak Park Mall. And I was trying to find a place to park. And there was a spot to park towards the front. I was like, cool, it's a Saturday, it's Christmas, there's a spot to park, that's great. The people next to the spot had their doors open, making it difficult to get into the spot. And I, so I stopped and gave them a few minutes and just sat there and kind of like, I was like, what are we doing here? And they were doing something in the back seat and the doors kept being open. And then they turned and they looked at me and then they kept doing what they were doing. They did not do the typical like, close the door and kind of scooch in to let your person park that we all do socially. So eventually I was like, my car's small enough. I'll just park over this direction and move on. So I did that and I parked and I got out and they didn't direct me. They didn't speak to me directly. They spoke to each other about me um, talking about how some people just, can you imagine wanting to go to the mall that bad and like had this like snotty attitude about it? I don't know these people. They are strangers to me. And I cannot stop thinking about that stupid moment. It ruined the rest of our, our trip. The whole rest of the time we're inside the mall. And I'm like, oh my God, those random women hate me. Oh my God, I'm a horrible human. That is rejection sensitive dysphoria. The emotional sensitivity and pain triggered by the perception that a person has been rejected or criticized. And so this really speaks to, again, the struggle that women have. Because not only do we have this that society puts on us, then you add having ADHD and you add this as a, like, I'm afraid that you're going to reject me and that I'm a horrible human. And so I'm going to people please. And I'm going to put on that mask so you never know what's happening behind the scenes. Because the thought that you don't like me makes me physically hurt and physically experience deep emotional pain and rejection. And so I'm going to cover it all up. And you're never going to know that inside I'm dying. And again, this is why we struggle with suicide, depression, and substance abuse. So these, all of these pieces speak to the, the differing and the understanding. And this is who people are. So I see a question here. Okay. I have to interrupt to get the, oh, yes, absolutely. That very much. So the question in the group, in the chat. Um, in group gatherings, I sometimes have to interrupt to get the question or the statement out. Otherwise, I forget what I was going to say. Absolutely. There's that like pressure of like, I have this idea. If I don't say it now, it's gone. Disappeared. So you feel that sense of like social pressure and you're like that social anxiety. Like, oh, I'm, I'm interrupting you. I'm so sorry, but I can't. And I cannot read and listen at the same time. Therefore, I don't hear or remember what was said to me. Absolutely. So it's, you cannot make that attention between the two. Your brain is paying all the attention to the hearing or all the attention to the writing, and it cannot do both at the same time. That absolutely resonates. For sure, I feel very much the same way. Um, one of the pieces was interesting. Um, I was, as I was kind of preparing for this, um, refreshing myself on the slides and this presentation, I went back to, and I'm going to skip back real fast right here to this ADHD iceberg. And I'm looking at all of this and I'm thinking of all the times for myself that like, I can't think of a simple word. And I stand in front of the classroom trying to figure out the word the, and I'm like, oh, um, and it feels awkward and weird. Or the auditory processing disorder. I've told many times, said, don't tell me anything. I will not remember it. You've got to write it down. Anything that's said to me, like literally goes in one ear and out the other. And I'm looking and I'm thinking about myself and my experiences. And I sat here and I was like, oh, this is why I am the way I am. And why I freaking mask and people please. And it was one of those like moments of like, I know this, 
but it was a reminder of that because it is a struggle. That auditory processing disorder, trying to hear what people are saying to you, trying to make sense of what they're saying to you, and trying to do multiple things at one time. All of those pieces are very difficult for those who have ADHD. So let's not end on doom and gloom. I never liked doom and gloom. Um, I said all of this to give us a sense of this is some of the challenges. So that then leads to what do we do about all this? So back to Jody's question, what suggestions do we have to do? Um, so part of the challenge with time management and clutter control is these pieces. Part of it, hang on, am I trying to go here? Sorry. Um, part of this is like the difficulty of organization because um, things, in order to organize, it becomes this like chain reaction of problems. In order to organize this, I have to organize this, which means I have to organize this, which means I have now like, what to me, it feels like five days worth of work and then just becomes overwhelming. And then you just do nothing because the overwhelm gets out of the way. So one of the things, and this is a new one that I've started trying for myself is for one visuals. So like the pictures of where things go, um, everything has a place and it doesn't really matter if it makes sense. It's fine, but there's pictures where you have spots to go. And the other one is the mantra, don't set it down, put it away. Don't set it down, put it away. Because what ends up happening is you have a thing and you set it down, which in your ADHD brain is like done. And then it disappears off the things you have to do. And it disappears out of your memory because you got rid of it. And then it sits there and then it becomes the thing, oh, I need to put that somewhere. And then when you go to put it somewhere, oh, I need to put this. So you just don't set it down, put it away. Whatever it is, put it away. And then starting to utilize much more like those visuals. So you have open, open shelves, open baskets, um, clear plastic organizers. So when you do put things away, they don't disappear into the black hole. That is the nothingness of our brains. Um, so having that sense of um, like, those organizational systems and the standard things that work for people that like do a little bit every day, like those don't usually work for you because that feels really boring. Um, so let me get to the end cup one second. Uh, so why are we talking about this now? I mean, if you're like me, so I grew up in the eighties and um, ADHD was like all the rage, um, was diagnosed in a lot of the boys in my class, you know, we would say awful things like take your chill pill, which I just feel terrible about now. Um, but now we're learning more because advancements in science and particularly neuroscience is helping us understand these differences. That's why you hear the language of neurodivergent versus neurotypical. We're taking what we think is typical and we're breaking the mold and learning more about it. So we're able to understand and see signs earlier. We're able to tease apart brain differences. We're able to tease apart behaviors in a better and different way than we used to be able to do so. We're also seeing a movement in the field towards a recovery and strengths-based perspective. So really, so a very positive psychology perspective. What I do in therapy is not try to fix you and make you work like everybody else. What I try to do is understand you and what works for you and help you create the environment in which you can survive and function in and thrive in. Instead of you're broken, I need to make you like everybody else. You're beautiful, you're amazing. We need to capitalize on your strengths and we need to create an environment that lets you do so. So that like the examples of having clear uh, totes and clear containers, that doesn't make any difference to anybody else. Somebody else might hate a clear container, but for me, it's amazing. I remember all the stuff I have because it's in a stupid clear container, but it works. And that's the kind of thing, nothing says you have to put all your stuff in a drawer. That's, there's no rule that exists for that. I say this a lot in therapy. There is no rule that says all your clothes have to be in a drawer and folded. If you want to hang every single piece of clothing up so you can see all of it at once, do it. There's nothing that says your underwear has to be folded neatly in the underwear drawer. That's not who says that. Throw it in a basket, throw it in a drawer and close it. Cool. That works. You're fine with it. That's what matters. So this is what I say. There's no rules. Now, the ex expectation of some jobs want you to be on time. 
that's a rule. Some jobs are like, like that's, I have a job and a boss. If I show up at 9.15, it's no big deal. If I show up at 9, if I show up at 8.30 because I woke up early and got done faster. Cool, that's great. So you find the places that fit you instead of making you fit the places that you're in. That is that shift in perspective, that recovery strengths-based perspective. The movement from what's wrong with you to what happened to you to what's right with you. And that's the other piece about ADHD. Some of these things can be huge strengths. If you can trigger a hyper-focus, you'd be in more of the stuff that can get done. And this is what I have some coworkers of mine that I say this to. I'm like, if people knew, and I say this uh, truthfully, I'm being a vulnerable here. If people knew how little I worked, because I can work in like crazy bursts, things that some people can get done in like five days. If you get me in a hyper-focus mode, it's done in like two hours. It's just getting to that hyper-focus mode and knowing when those deadlines are knowing the boundaries knowing those rules and expectations that's the piece it can be a huge benefit so i end up doing a ton of things in very fast spurts and it works for both me and my boss um so what we do people are not broken our goal isn't to fix them it's to understand how they function and work within that to live the life they want it's not about what I want for them or what their parents want for them. It's what they want for themselves. I'm laughing on this thing because I forgot. What did you call the time frame? Yeah, it's time blindness. Yes, my entire family has it. Not an excuse, just a realization. Absolutely. Yes. And you probably, your family is probably like mine, where at least for me, at least, I think everything takes 20 minutes. Like I live in independence. I pretty much assume everything in the city takes me 20 minutes to drive to. Um, and sometimes that's totally right. And I'm really on time and other times that's really, really wrong. And I'm very late. Um, what's killing me right now is the road construction on I-70. I never factor that in. I'm like, oh, it's 20 minutes to work. Oh, I forgot. Oh, we're down to two lanes. This is now a much longer commute. Shoot. And that's exactly time blindness. Um, I have paperwork monsters everywhere. It's out of control. I'm overwhelmed when we do it all. The thought of going through, oh, that's a great one. Yes. Okay. So let me tell you, let me switch to my next, my last slide. Where? Here we go. There we go. Oh, coping skills. So a couple of things to answer a few of your questions. I'll, I'll give some examples when I get there. Uh, so one, use timers to build in stopping points. Um, so any form, of, we do live in a cool technological society. Um, my husband says one of the best things that ever happened to him was getting an Apple watch. And so he is constantly like, Siri set 20 minute timer and then he'll do a thing and then timer goes off and he's like oh now I'm gonna go finish this thing so there's timers like everywhere I'll show you all my don't you know no judgment here is this safe space right I told you I use a lot of times and a lot of alarms so I have this habit of I just find the, the alarm in my phone so here's my phone and here are all of my timers I have like a bajillion for a variety of different times and that's what I'm like, oh, I need to be somewhere at 5.15, done, turn on that timer, check. And it, that's, it works. I don't make new ones. I just have a list of them that I pick from. So using timers to building stopping points and knowing yourself. So I know for me, I'm a visual person. I like to see the time. So I prefer an actual, like not a digital clock. I prefer an analog clock that has the like, the, the seconds and the minutes hands so I can watch it tick. I'm real jazz. I asked for Christmas. I asked for like really fun, funky, fancy um, game thing of the name. Here's an example, um, hourglasses. So like the hourglass has like, there's one of them that's a 30 minute timer and there's one that's a 15 minute timer. And they're these like really fun, modern things. I'm very excited to have these like pretty visual timers on my desk to help me organize my time. So using timers, turn off notifications. Here's another one. There's no rule that says you need to have a notification that says you got an email, you got an email, you got an email. There's no rule that says you need that. Because what will happen for a person who has ADHD, who's trying to do a project, who's in the middle of their hyper focus, and they hear the diddy, diddy, and the little flip and the little notification, and they're like, ooh, what's this new thing? Ooh, what's this shiny new thing? And then the project never gets completed because they've focused on the stupid emails that come in at random times. 
or not the notifications in time block. I read my emails from this time to this time. And then I'll come back to them from this time to this time. That allows you to then focus instead of trying to switch. A color coding. So again, we go back to like things that are boring. Don't make them boring. Make them pretty. Make them colorful. Um, I use a Google Calendar and every single thing I do has its own category and its own color. Um, other people look at it and they think it's like a monstrosity. And I'm like, I know exactly where I'm supposed to be. That's purple. That's fun. That's orange. That's this work. That's brown. That's teaching. Boom, I know it all. Color code it. Color code your papers. Color code your desk. Color code your calendar. Whatever you need to do to make it visually interesting. That helps with that lack of attention and that lack of focus because you can then choose and see the colors. Um, so in cup. So to answer TNT, your question. Okay. In cup is a acronym because we love acronyms in our field. Um, what this stands for is interest, novelty, challenge, urgency, and passion. So people who have ADHD often get their dopamine hits from these things differently than other people do. And so when you have something like a paperwork monster and stacks of things that are boring and overwhelming, any way that you can make it interesting and novel and urgent and a challenge is going to like tickle your little brain. So I'll give an example. I had this, um, uh, one of the committees I'm on, the clinical practice committee, we have to turn in uh, once a month, we give a, in a journal article for our staff to read about any random topic. So all you have to do, all you have to do is find a journal article. That's a really easy thing to do but it's really easy and really boring. And so when it's my turn to do it, I like struggle to the high heaven to get this very simple task done. And so what I did last month, I was like, all right, so the guy, his name is Vlad. I was like, Vlad, it is one o'clock. I am gonna challenge myself that I can get you your um, journal article in the next 10 minutes. And he looked at me, he goes, you can find a journal article that's interesting in 10 minutes. And I was like, bet. Got it. And so I went to my office and I was like, it did. I think it took me eight. Um, and he was like, Whoops. and I was like, thank you. That otherwise I would not have gotten that done. I've had to make myself have a challenge and create that sense of urgency. So uh, kind of what I would probably do in that, that instance is I would give myself a timer. How much can I get done in 10 minutes and challenge yourself or like find ways to make it colorful. You know, I've, I like our, our admin buys me colored folders. So I have like brightly colored folders in my desk and he'll, he'll buy, he buys me brightly colored pens. I write in everything colors with very fine tip pens because I'm particular about my feelings. Um, but all of those pieces are ways that you can access and kind of connect to things that seem boring. Find a way to make it interesting, make it novel, make it a challenge, make it urgent and give yourself passion. Those are ways that are going to help. And I know for myself, I'm out of time, I'm sorry, that it does make a difference. And that last example there is exercise. Exercise, we all know this, we all know this, and I'm gonna repeat it again, is that exercise is a way to focus and a way to get a different hit of dopamine and serotonin and all those beautiful hormones that we need. And so exercise can also give that like outlet for energy, a place to go. I mean, finding ways to use interest, novelty, challenge, urgency, and passion, but coupling it with exercise is going to make a difference. So those are some things in a short nutshell that can help with those who are ADHD. I will tell you, Brie, I'm working on, because I've been asked to request to do this, I'm working on a like 1.0 or like 2.0 of this particular presentation, where we talk about more of those coping skills and more of the like treatment aspect and I'm hoping to have that for a conference at the end of uh, middle of next year. So working on that. More to come if you want more to come. It'd be a great addition. I like that. Okay. So other questions. So, so Julie, for to answer your question, I would look at using kind of an in cup color coding. I would look at um, making it like a game. Those kinds of things. How fast can we get this done? Those kinds of things are going to make a difference. Okay. That is the end and I'm out of time. Looks like it's four minutes over. Um, if there are other questions, feel free to reach out to me. 
free. If you have anyone else reaches out, you're help, welcome to ask me and I'm happy, happy to help. And thank you all for your time and attention. I hope you enjoyed. Thank you so much, Laura. That was great. 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 Thank you guys who participated. Great questions. I'm looking yeah, forward to that. Out. I'm really looking forward to that. I'm excited. Thank yes. Uh, this is like probably the third time I've done this one and everyone's like, I need more in the treatment. So I'm like, sweet. No, I can't, I, I can't cram it all into an hour. So I'm probably going to do a whole like treatment one-on-one kind of a training. And you guys watching, you're probably like me. I'm just sitting there going, I do that. I do that. I do this. Like when you were saying um, the object permanence thing. Yep. Here's me. I'm like, here's this pretty shiny object. I'm going to put it here because I'm going to remember this is where I put it. Uh -huh. And then two months later, I'm like, where did I put that? Uh -huh. Does that it make made sense when I put it there, but I don't anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't even know my yeah. number. You know? Uh -huh. I have a question. Do you think, do you think that we've had ADHD forever since we've had human beings? Or do you think this is something that's developed later in life due to environment? I've read some interesting theories that, um, that hunter, certain types of our like ancient culture, that ADHD was super beneficial. It's like a lot of our hunter gatherer kind of communities where you needed the hyper focus, where you needed some of those type of things, that that would have been really beneficial and really served a purpose. So that I've read some things that they think that ADHD served a purpose a thousand years ago. But nowadays we live in a society that has so much more information that it has become a disability and a challenge because we don't live in, you know, the wilds of Kansas searching for, you know, Buffalo anymore. We now live in the world that's full of um, sensory information. So I've read some theories that it served a purpose in the past and no longer serves a purpose in it but it's still a remnant that's one interesting theory i never would have thought i would have thought it was something that was you know environmentally or nutritionally or some kind of you know something induced by that but that makes right. sense that you would need those kind of skills back then just kind of in a different way yeah huh. well thank you so much and thank you everybody Absolutely. that hopped Absolutely. on we are going to send you an email with the link for this video and then uh, I, I'll throw Laura's email address in there if that's okay with you. We have further yeah, questions. Um, please visit our website, nkch.org backslash class for further offerings similar to this. We have some great content on there. And uh, we look forward to seeing you guys soon. Have a great holiday. Take care. Bye.